A reading from the book of Exodus. The Lord said to Moses, Go down at once to your people whom you brought out of the land of Egypt, for they have become depraved. They have soon turned aside from the way I pointed out to them, making for themselves a molten calf and worshiping it, sacrificing to it and crying out, This is your God, O Israel, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. The Lord said to Moses, I see how stiff-necked this people is. Let me alone then that my wrath may blaze up against them to consume them. Then I will make of you a great nation. But Moses implored the Lord, his God, saying, Why, O Lord, should your wrath blaze up against your own people, whom you brought out of the land of Egypt, with such great power and with so strong a hand? Why should the Egyptians say, With evil intent he brought them out, that he might kill them in the mountains and exterminate them from the face of the earth? Let your blazing wrath die down. Relent in punishing your people. Remember your servants Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, and how you swore to them by your own self, saying, I will make your descendants as numerous as the stars in the sky, and all this land that I promised. I will give your descendants as their perpetual heritage. So the Lord relented in the punishment he had threatened to inflict on his people. The word of the Lord. Remember us, O Lord, as you favor your people. Our fathers made a calf in Horeb and adored a molten image. They exchanged their glory for the image of a grass eating bullock. They forgot the God who had saved them, who had done great deeds in Egypt, wondrous deeds in the land of Ham, terrible things at the Red Sea. Then he spoke of exterminating them, but Moses, his chosen one, withstood him in the breach to turn back his destructive wrath. Dominus Fobiscum. Lexio Sancti Evangelii Secundum Ioannem. Jesus said to the Jews, If I testify on my own behalf, my testimony is not true. But there is another who testifies on my behalf, and I know that the testimony he gives on my behalf is true. You sent emissaries, you sent emissaries to John, and he testified to the truth. I do not accept human testimony, but I say this so that you may be saved. He was a burning and shining lamp, and for a while you were content to rejoice in his light. But I have testimony greater than John's. 
The works that the Father gave me to accomplish, these works that I perform testify on my behalf that the Father has sent me. Moreover, the Father who sent me has testified on my behalf. But you have never heard his voice nor seen his form, and you do not have his word remaining in you because you do not believe in the one whom he has sent. You search the scriptures because you think you have eternal life through them. Even they testify on my behalf. But you do not want to come to me to have life. I do not accept human praise. Moreover, I know that you do not have the love of God in you. I came in the name of my Father, but you do not accept me. Yet if another comes in his own name, you will accept him. How can you believe when you accept praise from one another and do not seek the praise that comes from the only God? Do not think that I will accuse you before the Father. The one who will accuse you is Moses, in whom you have placed your hope. For if you had believed Moses, you would have believed me, because he wrote about me. But if you do not believe his writings, how will you believe my words? Verbum Domini. It was on May 8th, 1962, that a Pontiac station wagon up in Canton, Ohio at Santa Clara Monastery, loaded up with Mother Angelica, her mother, May Francis, and four nuns from the monastery in Canton, Ohio, May 8th, 1962. And so they wended their way from Ohio down here to Irondale, Alabama, and thus the beginning of Our Lady of the Angels here, which would eventually lead to this wonderful adventure of growth of this monastery being built, dedicated on May 20th, 1962, of the television network that now reaches the world with the gospel, and so many blessings because of that initial act of faith of Mother Angelica and the sisters. And there's one person in that station wagon that set out on May 8th, 1962, who just turned 90 years old. She's the only remaining uh, survivor of that group, Sister Mary Michael, turned 90 on February 25th, uh, just this past month, still carrying out her life of intercession and prayer. A beautiful soul. And when it was, when Mother Angelica had passed away, I had asked for her own reflections on Mother Angelica. And I've kept that, and I just want to share a few of her own thoughts about Mother. Her whole religious life, she said, was with Mother Angelica. Mother had entered seven years before her. On August 15th, 1951 is when Sister Michael entered, and Mother had entered seven years prior to that. So she came down here as part of this new foundation that Mother would begin. And as uh, she said, you know, one of the wonderful things about Mother is that she could see the root of a problem. She had this exceptional gift to see the root of a problem and to give sound practical advice on what a person should do. Why people still love to hear her advice on the shows that we continue to air. She would give daily lessons to the sisters, focusing on scripture, prayer, the Holy Spirit, examples of the saints, making it applicable to our daily life. Holiness was attainable to everyone. No one was born a saint. They had to work at it. 
her great devotion to the Blessed Sacrament. She cared for the ordinary person, wanted to make the gospel appealing to the ordinary person in the pews, to reach the masses and thus the network. She counseled many people, both Catholic and non-Catholic. Many of these were professional people. Problems could be quite varied, from family problems to spiritual. And she obviously gave great advice as they remained friends for life. Sometimes she knew a person was down and out. Maybe they'd lost their job, and she would slip some money into their hand to give them a little help. She knew what poverty was. She had a love for the poor growing up in a single parent family herself. Problems and challenges, Sister Michael wrote, did not discourage mother. They were opportunities to look for a solution. No pity parties allowed. <laughs> what seemed to be setbacks often turned out to be an opening to something bigger and better. When we could no longer roast peanuts because the buyers wanted kickbacks and mother said she was not going to lose her soul over a peanut, <laughs> we closed that phase of our life and went on to copying spiritual tapes, a far better work. When she could no longer tape her TV programs at a local TV station, she went on to found her own television network. She was never afraid to do what seemed ridiculous and God certainly performed miracles for her. Her only fear was not to do God's will. She mentions the story of the grotto in Canton. So when Mother was still up in Canton, the abbess has asked that there be a grotto to Our Lady, and she was having a hard time finding people to help. And so she called the local pool hall, her grandfather's cafe, and got some of the Tonys to come and to help. Some, she said, was kind of a mixture. Some were good, but some were not so good. But she had this heart for sinners, and she wanted them to do the work. She knew that that would bring blessings to them, too. And so they built this grotto. She had their names put there under the statue of Our Lady and uh, with a scroll of their names underneath the pedestal of Our Lady's feet. She had a heart for those who considered themselves sinners. She wanted them to know they were loved by God. And then finally, <clears throat> she wrote this. She said, and here's a beautiful picture. It was one of Mother's birthdays. This is Sister Michael with Mother. So she took care of Mother in the last years of her life, especially with Sister Gabriel and Sister Ray, uh, Regina. She said, several years ago, when Mother was still able to say a few words, she looked at me one morning with the most beautiful expression, one I will not forget, and with a beautiful smile and twinkling eyes, she haltingly managed to say, thank you for care of me. It was a most tender, precious moment for me as I was able to tell her of my own gratitude and feelings and to ask forgiveness for my failings toward her. Taking care of mother was like taking care of Jesus. Life without her will never be the same. There will always be a hole in our hearts. So happy birthday, Sister Mary Michael. Thank you for your beautiful witness of your consecrated life and intercession. And I wanted to begin with that because today we are looking at the example of Moses, the mediator, the intercessor. And in fact, the catechism refers to today's first reading. And the catechism has, if you've never read it, this is one of the best places perhaps you could start in the catechism, the section on prayer, section four. It's not that long, beautiful insights on prayer. And it begins by talking about the Old Testament figures of prayer and intercession. So you remember um, Abraham, he intercedes, he's praying to the Lord to have mercy on Sodom and Gomorrah. If there's 50 that are righteous there, will you not destroy it? I will not destroy it. What if there's 40? He keeps continuing to intercede. But there's a section of Moses 
and the prayer of the mediator. Because some would say, you know, what's the use of the sister's life of contemplative prayer? People ask that question. Why aren't they doing something that makes a difference? As if prayer really doesn't. You know, Mother said, when all is said and done, people will talk not, not about what was done, but how it was done. And it was the power of prayer. This was built on prayer, on adoration of the Blessed Sacrament. So she believed that this work that God had accomplished would show people the power of prayer, of intercessory prayer. So there's a section in the Catechism about Moses and the prayer of the mediator. And it says that Moses becomes the most striking example of intercessory prayer. So here he is, he's pleading for God. And God, in giving this warning, he's actually inviting Moses to become an intercessor. He didn't have to warn, you know, that they had broken the covenant and the, the elements of that covenant were that it was in blood. And so to break that covenant was to die. And so uh, the Lord gives Moses this warning so that Moses might be moved, give him the opportunity to be an intercessor, to plead for God's mercy. So the prayer of Moses becomes the most striking example of intercessory prayer. And what does Moses point to? Now he's an intercessor. And the psalm today said that he stood in the breach. So the covenant had been breached. There's this breach between heaven and earth by the sin of the people. And he's going to stand in the breach, breach and intercede. And who is the one that will ultimately be that one that stands in the breach? It's Jesus. So on the cross, we see the vertical dimension, heaven and earth. And it's through his death on the cross that he brings about that reconciliation. So he is the new Moses. Moses is a prefigurement, but his intercession, his mediation is going to be most perfectly fulfilled in Jesus Christ. And the Catechism talks about how God revealed himself in the burning bush to Moses. And God doesn't save his people just through his own work. Rather, he associates Moses in his compassion. Why does God want to save the people enslaved in Egypt? Because of his love for them. He wants to save them. But he's not going to do it alone. He calls Moses to be an associate in his compassion his work of salvation. There's something of a divine plea in this mission. In fact, you can say anyone who's associated with the, the Lord's work, there's a divine plea. Be reconciled to me. I'm reaching out to you, that we are associated to that work. You have the common priest of the, of the faithful. I have the ministerial priest to it. But all of us are to offer prayer, intercession, mediation, like our, our, our sisters up in Hansville, that really show the power of prayer, the power of intercession. And so Moses obtains this mercy for the people. He stands in the breach. And we too are called to be those intercessors. Sister Michael mentioned how Mother had a heart for sinners. She wanted them to actually build that grotto up in Canton. And through that, to think about the Lord more, to obtain graces through this work of charity that they were accomplishing. So the catechism again on Moses, you think about the battle with the Amalekites, his arms grew tired and so his arms are held up and. Israel had the better of the fight when his arms were held up in intercession. He pleads for Miriam, who became a leper, for her healing. 
but it is chiefly after their apostasy, when they worship the golden calf, it's chiefly there that Moses stands in the breach before God in order to save his people, inspiring boldness in our own intercession for people. So we too are called to be those who are interceding for sinners. You think of the Divine Mercy Chapel, Chaplet, so often a part of EWTN's history, thankfully. What a beautiful, powerful prayer where we are looking to that one who stood in the breach, Jesus. And we ask the Eternal Father to look upon the earth through his wounds and to have mercy on us and on the whole world. And perhaps today is a day for us to think about that example of Moses, to think about Jesus especially, and to think about our own role, that we too are called to be mediators in Christ, intercessors in Christ, pleading for God's mercy, for the conversion of sinners during this season of Lent. May we learn from the, the beautiful example of Sister Michael now, 90 years old, almost 70 years in religious life, taking up that role of intercession, of reparative thanksgiving for those who do not give thanks. And may we join the sisters in our own life of prayer, our own intercession, realizing that God can do great things just as he did here, especially in the hearts and souls of people.